Hello, everyone. My name is Alexander Konarski, and I'm a lead educator here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. I want to thank you all for joining us today as we move into our second live stream for the month of May, where we are continuing our theme all about endangered species. If you're new here, then welcome. Along with the live streams we do every single month, we also offer a really cool and free virtual scavenger hunt that you guys can play right at home along with an awesome activity guide. Both of them have new missions and activities each month. To download the application that you'll play that from, you wanna go and hop on over to www.wondersofwildlife.org forward slash mission dash conservation. This web address is gonna take you to our mission conservation webpage. And on this page, if you look over to the right, you're gonna see a little box that says, get the app. Right there is where you wanna click that download button and just follow the on-screen instructions. Once you have the app downloaded, create a user account and a login. Next, hit the search bar and type in mission conservation. This is where all of the at-home missions will pop up for you to play. If you look a little bit further down on the webpage, you're gonna see the featured mission section. The featured missions are the most current missions that we have to offer, like one of our Lichen Research Lab ones. And the last place I want to bring your attention to is the schedule of missions and activities section. That's all the way down. So scroll all the way to the very, very bottom. And that's where you're going to see all of our other missions that are live. And if you click a little plus sign next to either one of those, it'll drop down a little tab. And that's where you're going to find the links to the activity guides for the at-home missions. The activity guides have an indoor craft as well as a really cool, fun outdoor activity to get you outside. And this is also where you're going to find many of our partners' missions descriptions. All right, now enough of that, but if you look behind me, you're going to see our Ozark Hellbender exhibit. Ozark Hellbenders are a subspecies of Hellbender found here in southern Missouri and a few other states in the United States. The Ozark Hellbenders are federally listed as an endangered species in 2011, and the populations for them as well as the eastern Hellbenders in this area are still declining. Many things can cause this decrease, such as introduction of predatory species within ecosystems, pollution in waterways, as well as man-made obstacles and developments. There are those who are doing what they can, however, to help, such as the Missouri Department of Conservation and local institutions such as the St. Louis Zoo. And their Ozark Hellbender breeding program is doing so much to help introduce hellbenders back into their local historical ranges. Today, we're going to be meeting with Tracy Albrick, an interpretive specialist with the Bureau of Land Management, and Alexandra Sojoka, a wildlife biologist with the Bureau of Land Management within the interpretive world, however. Tracy is also known as Tracker. And Tracker and Alex are here tuning in with us all the way from the famous Coachella Valley, where they will lead us on an exploration to find some of the local wildlife and native flora of that region. So without further ado, take it away, you two. Thanks, Alex. It's really good to be here. We are enjoying a very sunny day in the California desert. It's a little windy as well, so I hope you can hear us okay. I'm an interpretive specialist with the Bureau of Land Management, and that means that I get to do education programs and brochures and interpretive panels that help Americans and visitors to America learn more about their public lands. And at Bureau of Land Management, we manage a lot of the states in the West open space. Not so much of that in Missouri, but if you come out to California, you'll see a lot of this logo on our signs that welcome you to have a great recreational experience on public land. Today, we're in the Coachella Valley, and behind me is Mount San Jacinto, which is the steepest peak in North America. We'll talk about that later. My name is Alex and I'm a wildlife biologist. It's pretty hot out here. So I was just putting some sunblock on and enjoying the desert out here. So on Mount San Jacinto, there are a lot of different elevations. This is the, the, the steepest peak I said in North America, but it's also over 10,000 feet high. And at the top, you'll see some snow. That's where uh, high elevation animals and plants live like conifer forests, even bald eagles. Down here in the desert, we have golden eagles <clears throat> and everything in between. So there's a lot of biodiversity here and there is a lot of different habitats to afford the plants and animals 
to have what they need. Today, we're gonna to focus about on endangered species. And endangered species is a great topic for everyone to understand because it takes all of us to work together to help endangered species. In 1973, the Endangered Species Act was developed and signed by President Nixon. And since then, the situation for plants and animals that need our help has improved a lot. There's a lot of success stories where plants and animals have gotten small in their species and even in their populations. And due to certain laws that help people understand and behave differently around them, the endangered species have improved. Give me a trace. So one of the other things that I work on out here is I work on a lot of renewable energy. Um, as, a, as a wildlife biologist, I'm um, working to help some of the endangered species uh, as those installations go out in the desert. So as we kind of have alluded to, the desert can be a pretty inhospitable place sometimes. It can be very sunny and as you may have noticed, also extremely windy. But one of the cool things about the desert is that we can actually use some of those things that can make it very uncomfortable um, to provide energy. Um, so, and so solar and wind are both uh, what we consider renewable energy, which is actually generally a little better to use than non-renewable energy sources. Non-renewable energy sources like oil and gas are, are, once we use those, those are used up. So um, yeah, so uh, we, we have a lot of renewable energy out here in the desert. Well, we're gonna take you on an armchair adventure to visit the Coachella Valley through some slide pictures. But first we wanna guide you on a leave no trace ethic that's really important. Leave No Trace is a system of ethics that help us to go out and explore in the outdoors, have fun, make memories, but also leave it for the next person to find in good condition and um, great for the plants and animals that we bypass. So down below we have some items here that Alex and I always take when we go out on a hike. It's so always I important to plan ahead and be prepared. So. Here's some of the things we like to bring with us when we're going hiking. As I mentioned, I always like to bring sunblock. Don't protect, protect your skin, don't get burned. And I like to bring sunglasses to protect my eyes. I also always like to take a headlamp or a flashlight in case we get stuck out after dark so that we can make sure we get back to back home. And if a flashlight doesn't work due to batteries, uh, you can bring a little mirror and this mirror will be able to use the sunlight to cause a refraction. Also, always great to bring maps or a field guide. That way um, you know where you are and you know what you're looking at. If an adult or somebody trained is coming along, it's good to bring a first aid kit just in case you need it. And water, super important, especially out here in the desert. I always like to make sure I'm fully hydrated and uh, I see Tracker, you brought me a snack. Oh, uh, yeah, oh, sure, the apple's for you, not me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I like to bring sun uh, lip balm so that my lips stay moist and don't dry out. And I'll bring my own water as well. Please go in my pack. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about endangered species now and uh, tour around the Coachella Valley. So if there isn't a slide up yet with a very interesting looking creature, we can bring that up now. And you're looking at the Coachella Valley fringe toad lizard and he's a mascot for endangered species because he's a success story. The Coachella Valley fringe toad lizard lives only in one environment and that's called blow sand. Here in the San Jacinto, Mount San Jacinto area, it's a wind zone because we're in a pass and the Coachella Valley fringe toad lizard thrives in the blow sand that's caused from this. <clears throat> and in the next slide, you'll see Mount Hat San Jacinto with some of those renewable resources that Alex was talking about. And those are wind turbines. They take advantage of free, unending energy. It's not windy here every day, but some say it's windy 300 out of 365 days a year. And this energy is transferred from wind energy into electrical energy. 
the <clears throat> pass is exceptionally windy because there's two mountains that the air has to pass through. And this is called the Venturi effect. The Venturi effect is kind of like when you put your finger over the end of a hose with water running and your thumb is the cause for the space to get smaller. So the water has to travel faster. Well, air does the same thing. It behaves the same way and the Venturi effect explains it. In areas like this, we're in white water today, the wind gusts can be 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. And today they're between 30 and 45 miles an hour. So uh, we have our hats on really tight today, don't we? Oh yeah. So traveling around the Coachella Valley to the Southern end, we'll have the Santa Rosa Mountains and together the Santa Rosa and Santa Cena Mountains also make up a national monument that the Bureau of Land Manage Management manages along with the Forest Service. And we're at the base of this national monument. The Santa Rosa Mountains extend south all the way into the Salton Trough area. And historically, the area was very different. It's hard to imagine, but there was uh, the extension of the Sea of Cortez all the way up into the Coachella Valley. The Salton Sea is there today. It's California's largest body of water, about 45 miles long and 10 miles across, only about 40 feet deep. And it's a remnant of the time where the Sea of Cortez came way up here. But on the one slide, you'll see an ancient shoreline. And that's kind of like a bathtub ring from when the ocean used to come all the way up there. Well, exploring more into the Santa Rosa Mountains, you'll find a wide variety of great places for plants, animals, and humans. My favorite is the palm oasis. The desert palm oasis is very cool and shady and on hot days, it's a really great place to be. Um, but if you go up into the mountains, you'll find car coniferous forests with pine trees and meadows, and it's lovely up there as well. So let's go on to an endangered species back into the desert. We have the Coachella Valley milk vetch. And that's a plant that's very pretty. It's got uh, beautiful purple flowers. Not a lot of people see this because it's only uh, available to grow or able to grow in small places uh, in the whole world, just around here in the Coachella Valley. And again, like the fringe toad lizard, it needs that blow sand to survive. It doesn't exist, it doesn't survive anywhere else. The purple flowers have uh, parts that get pollinated and turn into seeds. And you can see that their seed is like a pillow. And after the, pill the seed develops, the pillow breaks off, rolls around due to the wind and gets dispersed elsewhere and the milk vetch gets to grow other places. Along with being named after the Coachella Valley is that fringe toad lizard. And here's some neat pictures of it so you can see how well it's adapted to blow sand and sand dunes. Its feet have little fringes on them. That's what it's named for. And its nose and face is sort of shaped like, I think it looks like a frog, but it's almost like a shovel so that the fringe toad lizard can survive with its behaviors as well as its body parts. A behavioral adaptation it has is when a predator comes along like a roadrunner or a coyote, the fringe toad lizard who's already camouflaged can walk or run along the sand dune, dive in with that shovel nose face and swim a little bit with his uh, fringe toed feet and disappear completely from its predator below the sand dune surface. And that's a very important way that he survives. Uh, both of these species are endangered and the Coachella Valley milk vetch is uh, due to uh, invasive species. Other plants that are like weeds have invaded into its territory. So a way that we can help them is to remove those weeds and let the milk vetch grow. You can do that at home by removing weeds in your yard and growing plants that are naturally there and native. For the Coachella Valley, its impact that's causing it to be an endangered species is human impact by urban sprawl. And urban sprawl is simply when there's more schools, homes, malls, 
roads, shopping centers built, and it invades into their habitat. So the good thing about the Endangered Species Act, it gives us all direction on planning and protecting areas where the fringe toad lizard uh, needs to live. Now we're gonna learn about an animal that lives on the Rocky Hillside. So the next species we're gonna talk about that is an endangered species is the bighorn sheep. The population that lives out here is called the peninsular bighorn sheep. And we actually just found out this week some uh, hopefully good news. It, it is still currently considered endangered, but based on some, um, some of the recent research and population studies that have been going on out here, it appears that their numbers are on the rise and there's more than more of them now. So there, we're thinking that it's going to actually be lowered to the threatened status, which is still, still we need to protect them, but it's better than being endangered. That means that they're recovering. So hopefully we'll hear more about that soon. Um, so some facts about the bighorn sheep. They live in groups called herds. When they are born, the babies weigh about eight to 10 pounds, which is about the size of a very large human baby. But unlike a human baby, a uh, baby bighorn sheep can actually start walking within just a couple of hours of being born, which is pretty incredible. Um, but it's really important because they live on these really steep slopes like you can see behind us in the mountains. Um, they, uh, some other adaptations they have, they blend in with their environments. They're kind of like gray, brown, whitish. Um, and a lot of times you won't even see them until they start moving up the slope. Um, what else? Both the males and the females have horns. The males obviously are bigger than the females, but they use them for finding food as well as fighting. And the males during mating season uh, use their horns to spar with each other, knocking their horns together to establish dominance. And they actually have some interesting bone structures in their heads that protect their brains um, from getting damaged so they don't get concussions when they're fighting with each other which is pretty cool. Um, so some of the threats to the bighorn, their primary predator is the mountain lion, um, which is also part of the reason they need to be able to run around on the steep slopes. They have really good feet for clinging to rocks. Another thing they do is when they travel in their groups, they'll, they'll stand and look in all different directions so that they can uh, always be on the lookout for any predators that are approaching. Um, another big issue that's been uh, affecting the population out here is actually the spread of various diseases from um, livestock. So like from sheep that you might see on a farm, those sheep can get some diseases like pneumonia and those can actually be spread to the populations out here, which isn't good for them. Um, as Tracker mentioned, also urban sprawl and development um, causes habitat fragmentation which basically what that means is it isolates different groups of the sheep and they're not able to find each other and breed, uh, which also isn't good. Wildlife corridors are something that can help out with that. Um, another thing that you can do at home is um, if you're going for a hike, always keep your dog on a leash. Dogs can scare away the wildlife and particularly out here in the desert, um, especially during drought, uh, water is such a scarce resource when animals go to watering holes to go drink water. If a dog disrupts them and they scare, it scares them away, they'll have to use a lot of energy to run away and come back to find that water again later. Well, you might be surprised to find that there's an animal here that lives in the water. Water is very scarce here. We only get uh, under five inches of rain many years and we have a high rate of evaporation. But long ago, there was water here when Mount San Jacinto wasn't so tall. And we have a remnant species called the desert pupfish. Uh, the males are blue, the females are brownish. They're only about as big as your finger. And they're endangered. Um, however, they're thriving where they live. They live, of course, in waterways that exist all year. And it, some of these waterways can be very shallow but they're very, very adaptable. They can live in high alkaline or kind of soapy water, salty water, hot water, cold water. They survive all those conditions. <clears throat> they're left over from when the Coachella Valley had more water and uh, then it dried out. And there's a slide that shows little shells. Those are called conchias. In fact, the Coachella Valley is named after those conchias. <clears throat> and after the a uh, valley dried out and the water drained away. We only have a few streams left and that's where those pupfish are. 
But back in the, in the Ice Age, about 30,000 years ago, and even far more recently, the Coachella Valley was quite different. It supported large fauna like mammoths and mastodons, saber-toothed cats, giant ground sloths. And we also had some animals we have living today, such as the California condor and the pupfish. So the pupfish are endangered, not because the land has changed by humans, but because of natural climate change. That's the trigger that has caused these uh, fish to go endangered. And you can see in the image that there's a quite a wide variety of the animals that lived here during the ice age that the pupfish lived among. <clears throat> well, our next species, we're gonna go back to the land. In fact, they stay away from water and um, they're scaly as well, like the pupfish. So I'm gonna talk about the desert tortoise now, which is um, one of my favorite species out here. It's uh, really cool and really well adapted to living in the desert out here. Um, so it's considered threatened. Uh, which is good because it's not endangered, but we want to keep it at that level and hopefully continue protecting it so that it can get back to being being good. Um, so does anybody know the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Because I didn't actually know. Um, so the main difference is that tortoises don't swim. They live on land. And as Tracy mentioned, yeah, they, there's, not, there's not a lot of water out here. So they actually can spend um, up to... 90% of their time, not only on the land, but underground. So they dig burrows, which they spend a lot of their time in. And part of the reason that they do that is to protect themselves from water loss uh, due to the really high temperatures in the desert. Um, they're also really great. They're, they're considered what's called a keystone species, which if you don't know what that is, it means that a lot of the other plants and animals in the environment that they live on um, really depend on them and that they're really integral to the ecosystem as a whole. The reason that desert tortoises could be considered a keystone species is because they dig these burrows and so many other animals that live in the desert use them. And again, it's so hot out here. So where do you want to be when it's hot during the day? You want to hide in the shade, ideally underground where it's a little cooler if you can. So the burrows that the tortoises dig can host all kinds of animals. They can be used by rodents like squirrels and mice, other reptiles like lizards and snakes, and even birds like burrowing owls. So everybody out here loves the desert tortoises. So here's some more facts about them. Um, they can remember and use up to 25 different burrows in their home territory. Um, also, they do something interesting. I don't know if you know, I'm sure you know about hibernation, but I'm not sure if you know about brumation. So hibernation is what warm-blooded animals like bears do um, to survive in the winter. Uh, the opposite is true for animals that are cold-blooded. They, well, usually it depends, cold or warm, but um, they'll, so desert tortoises will do what's called brumation instead of hibernation. So they'll go into their burrow and basically kind of just be asleep for a long period of time until they're able to wake up and go out and eat. Um, what else? So they're also really cool because they can live a really long time, maybe even up to 100 years. Out here um, in the desert, maybe like 50 to 80, but in, uh, in captivity, they can live even longer than that. Another thing about them, though, is that it takes them quite a long time to get to adulthood to be able to reproduce. It takes them like 15 to 20 years. Um, another crazy fact is that they can go almost a year without drinking water, which is a really great adaptation, but obviously they, they don't want to do that. But when they do finally encounter water, they can drink up to 50% of their body weight just in one go. And I did the math on this. That would be like if I drank nine gallons of water all at the same time. I think my body would explode if I tried to do that. So good thing the desert tortoises are able to do that. So some threats for them, a really big threat out here for them is actually ravens, which is a, sort of similar to a crow. It's a large black bird that lives out here. A lot of animals don't do super well living in cities and around humans, but ravens are actually one, um, one animal that really thrives around humans. And unfortunately, this is due in a large part to the fact that they really like to eat trash. And we humans are sometimes good at leaving trash out. Um, 
Anyway, uh, because of the fact that ravens uh, have been increasing due to human population numbers, ravens can um, can prey on those baby tortoises because their shells are not hardened for a number of years. So while they're still soft and squishy, they're a really tasty snack for a raven. Um, so one thing we can do to help the desert tortoises out is always um, throw your trash away properly and especially at home, secure your trash. So if you're putting your trash out before the trash people take it away, uh, make sure that the lid is locked on so that no animals, this is good everywhere, so that no raccoons, bears, ravens, anything gets into your trash because trash isn't good, isn't good for animals. Um, yeah, that's all the facts I got. Well, there's a lot of other, a few other endangered species that live in the area. We're going to go over them lightly, like the Palm Springs pocket mouse. These animals have declined due to have habitat fragmentation or urban sprawl. And the pocket mouse is also adapted to low sand and the desert. It has fur lined pouches that it carries its seeds in. It eats mostly seeds, some insects, but it's, uh, it's being affected by urban sprawl. The burrowing owl is another species, really a cute species. It's uh, an owl, like an owl, it's a predator and a carnivore. However, this owl is diurnal. That means it's active in the day, not at night. It's a small owl. It's about two uh, size of two of your fists put together. <clears throat> they live to be about 10 years old. A very sensitive species is called the Casey's June beetle. And it lives in Palm Springs, California, about 10 miles away. And it only has about 60, 600 acres of land that it uses. The whole world's population, all of the species of the Casey's June beetle is limited to that one spot. There's another plant that is very limited. It's called the hidden blue curls. And it lives up at the top of Mount San Jacinto in Mount San Jacinto State Park. It's a beautiful little really little flower. It's a purplish blue with green leaves and the uh, the ecologist up there finds it by crawling around on his or hers hands and knees. Well I have good news the hidden blue curl, hidden belly blue curls has been taken off the endangered species list because it's in recovery and the numbers have been going up. What happened is the state park put a nice boardwalk around it so that when people uh, were attracted to a meadow area, they didn't step on the blue curls. Now they're instructed to stay on the boardwalk, which they do. And the blue curls has made a really quick recovery after that happened. Well, we are um, really happy to share the Coachella Valley with you today and help you learn about endangered species. And we hope that you are better aware that endangered species can use our help by keeping your dog on a leash, by planting native plants in your yard, removing weeds, being aware uh, where wildlands are and helping them be wild. Um, by keeping dog on a leash, by- uh, Securing your trash and always oh, throw yeah. your trash away. Stay on the trails. So we can live in harmony with nature and we encourage you to do that. And when you're out West, visit public lands, just look for your local Bureau of Land Management office. And we'll have all kinds of free maps and information for you. Take it wow. away, Alex. I would say I'm kind of taken back a little bit here. I mean, Tracker Alex, that was so much. I mean, I'm from Southern California originally, but as a child, I know I definitely took for granted the amount of wildlife and like flora that's out there in those areas. Cause for me, I always looked out there and thought, man, it's desolate. It's hot. There might, there's probably not a lot of stuff out there. Why would I want to go over there? But seeing all that today, seeing all the different wildlife and everything that you guys are able to show us and help bring to light was so awesome. So as we end the live stream today, I would like to say thank you to everyone that tuned in to be here with us live and all of those that may be finding this video a little bit later down the road. I also, of course, want to give a special thank you to Tracker, Alex, the entire team at the Bureau of Land Management, as well as every wild adventure and conservation advocate out there helping give our world a helping hand. If you enjoy the time we've spent together today, please show us support by giving us a thumbs up underneath the video. And if you'd like to know what we have coming up in the future and want to stay in front of all of our live streams, 
Just simply click the subscribe button below and you'll be able to find all of our awesome videos from the past, as well as those that have easier access to those that have yet to come. Our next live stream is gonna be on June 7th with the Boone and Crockett Club, so set that reminder. As we leave today, I of course wanna challenge everyone to get outdoors, advocate for conservation and help be a voice for all of our wildlife friends. We are so lucky to have this wild world around us and it's up to everyone to protect it. This is Alex signing off and I can't wait to see y'all next time. Stay wild out there. <laughs> I got all confused at we the beginning. Up that intro. <laughs> I did. I we did. both did. Mine. <laughs>